Live from Washington, D.C., this is Transport Topics Newsmakers, the digital interview series that gives you access to candid conversations between industry experts and a veteran reporter. Here's your host, Dan Ronan. Hello and welcome to this latest edition of Newsmakers from Transport Topics. I'm Dan Ronan, along with our senior government reporter, Eugene Malero. With Newsmakers, we are always pleased to have regular conversations with leading figures in the trucking, freight, and logistics industries. Today, we'll look at the nearly 18 months since President Joe Biden signed the Infrastructure and Jobs Act back in November of 2021. The law, as you know, calls for more than $1 trillion in federal spending over the next five years, and state and local governments are expected to contribute as well, significantly increasing the amount of money available. With that much cash in the spending pipeline, many important people in the process are those in the 50 state capitals who are tasked with rebuilding and fixing our highways, roads, and airports. Joining us to discuss this today is John Lee. He is ASHTO's Deputy Director and Chief Policy Officer. ASHTO is the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. It's a nonpartisan DC-based association representing those state highway and transportation officials. A little background about Mr. Lee. He's a graduate of the University of Virginia. He holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Pennsylvania. He joined ASHTO in 2007. John, thanks for joining us. We're going to begin the questioning with Eugene Malero. Go ahead, Eugene. John, as you know, we're already um, you know, entering year two of the implementation of the $1.2 trillion infrastructure law, the in Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, um, there's many stakeholders uh, with a deep interest in how this law is being implemented. From your perspective, from Ashto's point of view, can you tell us, you know, broadly how the implementation is going? Yeah, no, first of all, thank you, Dan and Eugene, for the opportunity to join you today. Um, we are absolutely, you know, neck deep at this point on implementation of the IIJA. It really is, you know, um, quite the historic funding increase that we saw as part of the broader infrastructure package that covered not just transportation, but other asset classes, right, like broadband, energy, etc. cetera. Um, I think, you know, one of the perhaps unforeseen challenges in the lead up to IIJA enactment was just how substantial the impact of inflation uh, would be. So, you know, obviously some serious headwinds in terms of the purchasing power loss that our membership, the state DOTs that are carrying out really robust programs on projects funded uh, with the support of the IIJA. Definitely it's not as, you know, um, impactful in terms of just how much you're able to do. But on the flip side, you know, if we didn't have uh, the IIJA and this kind of, you know, uh, inflation supply chain challenges hit, uh, I don't even want to think where we would be at this point. Um, it would be such a drastically negative impact without the IIJA. So we're definitely grateful uh, for that. I think, you know, Dan, you mentioned the trillion dollars, big number, that's the headline, right? Uh, and the expectations uh, are very high, uh, and as it should be, really, from the elected officials to the public that uses the transportation system. So the state DOTs are really, you know, uh, doing as much as we can in not only delivering the programs and projects that improve safety, mobility, and access, but also telling the story of how that progress is being made under the IIJA. We're certainly on under no illusion, right, that, you know, the IIJA expires in 2026, and it is going to come up for another multi-year renewal, and that if we don't have enough to show for it in terms of here's the historic investment, what do you got, uh, then it's really going to be to the detriment to, you know, what we can do in terms of building on the momentum that was created under the IIJA for the long term. Um, I would also say that, you know, in terms of uh, how the discretionary grant program dollars are handled. That, that's a really big area of focus for the state DOT members because, you know, our uh, state DOT uh, all over the country, really, the bread and butter uh, really as part of the federal aid highway program has been the formula program, right? So the formula program sets the broad 
national goals and objectives. And it's really up to the states and their local partners to determine what's the optimal project mix here. And that is still the bulk of the funding from IIJA, but the discretionary grant programs are ones administered directly by the US Department of Transportation in terms of, look, here are the criteria, send in your applications, we'll pick the projects, and then you can get underway on that. And, and that's a big paradigm shift, I think, in terms of just the sheer volume of discretionary grant dollars available compared to just kind of the typically, you know, the raise grants that we've had, the yeah. infra grants have been around for a while, but there are so many new programs that I think everybody's trying to get the most out of in figuring out, like, how do we fit our project, you know, uh, plans to fit like what the USDOT and the administration is looking for. Before the IAJA, there were a number of state initiatives, California, uh, Alabama, uh, Illinois, uh, Pritzker, the governor there, got a $22 billion package through the legislature. So there was a pretty fair amount of money already in the pipeline, wasn't there beforehand, uh, sort of an anticipation that uh, once Biden got in and got this passed, that there would be money, uh, an even larger pot of money available. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Then look, I mean, the states have been really at the forefront in being able to make that value proposition of like, hey, if we're able to raise additional revenues, we can demonstrate tangibly these are the kinds of improvements in the form of, you know, projects or ultimately, you know, the quality of life kind of at the state and local level that we can really show you. And we've had at this point 30 plus, uh, actually, I think over 40 states uh, over the last couple of decades that have done some sort of a major revenue measure, a lot of them in the form of the gas tax, right? Um, and that, I think, you know, has been our message that, hey, the states are stepping up to the plate. The feds, you really need to come to the plate uh, as well. And obviously, the, the federal government really has delivered in the form of IJA. But in terms of how that was paid for, you know, I mean, the Highway Trust Fund still has a major, you know, um, difference between how much it brings in in the form of truck fees and motor fuel taxes and then the expenditures that are going out. I mean, we're looking at by fiscal year 2027, the trust fund's going to have a $36 billion cash flow deficit. And, and that is a massive, massive number it used to be in, you know, a couple uh, billion dollars, you know, when it uh, started this differential in 2008 or so. Um, so that is also a very serious looming challenge. John, uh, Astro recently hosted its high profile Washington meeting. Uh, keynote speakers were members of Congress as well as officials over at the Department of Transportation. Um, can you share some of your takeaways from what you heard in these keynote addresses from lawmakers as well as regulators? Yeah, um, absolutely. You had really just great, I think, showing of the leading members of Congress. Uh, we also heard from key staff that we work very closely with uh, from the Hill as well. And I think, you know, again, it's just, are we able to meet the expectations here? Um, are we able to uh, show, you know, um, here's kind of the capital plan here. Um, and thanks to the IIJA, we're able to do the kinds of projects that perhaps had to be pushed out indefinitely, right, into the out years, um, into kind of the more of the, like, within the next few year window. And for capital programs, yes, it does take some time. And as I kind of alluded to earlier, the expectation management is really important, right, in that we can't turn on a switch and then you have, like, brand new infrastructure. Obviously, it takes time. Uh, to get there. But I think, you know, in combination of, again, kind of the formula dollars that are the backbone of the federal program, combined with, you know, the discretionary grant awards, we are able to see the kinds of projects. I mean, I think Brent Spence Bridge, right, in Kentucky and Ohio is the classic case. So a project that has been talked about for a long, long time, um, but you just can't find enough money to kind of squirrel away to do a project like that without something like the IIJA. And you have those types of projects all throughout the country that are starting to come online. So I think the more of those opportunities that the members in Congress that voted for the bill can see, even the ones that didn't uh, vote for it, you know, the, they'll 
be able to realize the benefits for their constituents, right? So it's really about showing the kind of the tangible benefits and also telling the story about it. Um, I, I think that just remains really crucial with our congressional uh, partners and also obviously in, in partnership with not just USDOT, but the local governments as well. We didn't for many years really invest in our highways, our roads, our bridges, our airports like we should have. Would you agree at that, that we, we built this magnificent transportation system in the 50s and 60s and 70s, and then we sort of let it decay. We did routine maintenance, we did the asphalt and the rebar, but the big stuff we kind of let get by the, by the boards, didn't we? Yeah, no, look, I mean, I think we keep talking about kind of the seminal moments in transportation history, right? Like the Erie Canal, the Transcontinental Railroad, the interstate highways, the space travel. I think what has been lacking is a compelling national vision of like, what is the next big step that transportation can really help to advance uh, to the benefit of, you know, broader society. And I think to that end, I mean, the state DOT CEOs that sit on our board of directors, um, they've really been putting their heads together to look at what does like, say, a moonshot for transportation could look like uh, in terms of coming up with that vision that ultimately benefits at the community level and then going upwards. Uh, and so that is actually a major project that we've been undertaking that you'll hopefully hear more about as things kind of coalesce a little bit more in terms of what do the moonshot strategies, what, what, what can it look like? Um, so we're very excited about an effort like that to the effect that you're talking about, Dan. In addition to investing in, in maintenance and in new projects, there's also the perpetual focus on safety. Um, and I know that your group has been, you know, a uh, proponent of safety as well as, you know, the entire transportation community. We've been hearing uh, from previous administrations and this administration as well about, you know, recent data on highway fatalities. Uh, can you talk about, you know, your Astro's reaction to this administration's focus on highway safety and also where, um, you know, the country, you know, a trajectory on, you know, best practices for improving safety? Great question. Um, you know, we have, uh, you know, Ashto President Roger Millar uh, this year, uh, he serves as the Secretary of the Washington State DOT, and he has laid out a very clear and I think compelling vision in terms of the you know guidance to be provided in everything that Ashto does under his presidency and his platform is a creating a resilient national transportation system that is safe sound and smart um, so by resilience he's talking about not just kind of the natural disasters or even like cybersecurity, but looking at what are the long-term demographic changes that we can anticipate what are the other kinds of, there's always gonna be changes both anticipated and unanticipated. How can we best adapt to them? That's really kind of his expansive definition of resiliency, but kind of looking at the three legs under that, you know, safety um, is something that I think really continues to be a huge uh, concern and a challenge for all of our members because the trend line has really reversed, right? In terms of, seeing the gradual reduction in highway fatalities uh, to kind of having that constant increase uh, and even just perhaps plateauing a little bit, but it's just unacceptable. Um, and what we've been talking about in the state DOT community is what are the really meaningful things that we can do? Uh, we keep talking about it, but really we need to bring the best of our different disciplines represented in the ASHTO committees, right? So from like planning to performance management to funding and finance to safety, we have really terrific and I think kind of the leading experts when it comes to everything highway and transportation at ASHTO. So uh, President Millar has called for an interdisciplinary safety summit. Uh, we're looking in all, October of this year that can help really inform the state DOTs of these are the really the best practices that are going on elsewhere. 
And this is the way we can form our strength and really the partnerships that we have throughout the industry to make a meaningful difference when it comes to safety. Um, but he also, you know, Roger talks about uh, the, you know, uh, sound and smart as well in terms of, you know, maintaining our assets in peak condition, making sure that the current asset management plans are further strengthened, uh, in not just using the federal dollars, but using all the resources there, and then using ITS and other forms of technology to get the most out of the system that we do have. Okay. To, Eugene's, to Eugene's point about transportation safety, the National Safety Council is out with some new numbers for the previous year about highway deaths. They're up again. Uh, we've gone from 38,000 to now we're into the low to mid 40,000. So about a 10 or 12% hike in the last three years of the pandemic. And I think that you know that uh, we, we see people doing really stupid things on the roads, texting while driving. Uh, we see people... Uh, levels of intoxicated driving, impaired driving. Now we have the issue of uh, more states are legalizing uh, cannabis, which again uh, is a concern that uh, we have as a uh, transportation safety advocates here. So is, do you really, do you really, really, really realistically, excuse me, see a way that if so much of this is based on individual personal behavior, texting, drinking, uh, not paying attention, fatigue driving, that you guys can do a lot, but yet it seems as though your hands are tied by what you really can do. Well, look, I mean, I think Roger Millar, again, the ASHA president, he has a very, I think, compelling data that he uses, which is that state DOTs collectively, you know, expend about $200 billion a year. So that's a lot of money oh, yeah. uh, to be invested in our transportation system but that the economic costs of highway fatalities uh, is amounting now to about $1.4 trillion. It's devastating. Absolutely devastating. Um, and, you know, are we able to do more uh, in terms of looking at just every aspect of how you improve safety? And that's where, you know, a safe system approach is something that has really come to the forefront. So whether it's, you know, um, safer people, uh, right, uh, and driver behavior, but safer vehicles, safer speed, safer roads, post-crash care. All those elements, I think, have to really be strengthened, again, in partnership with uh, all the constituents in the space. This isn't just a state DOT thing, right? This is, again, working with our local partners, working with, um, you know, uh, safety advocates, uh, as well. And we do appreciate that Secretary Buttigieg has called for a national roadway safety strategy, right? It came out about a year ago, but there's been a, a, like a real clarion call to action that took place uh, about a month ago. And Ashto is really proud to be, you know, part of the first movers uh, as part of that effort as well uh, to, again, get that meaningful improvement in safety. Eugene? Hey, John, uh, changing, shifting gears a little bit, uh, you know, budget season has officially begun. Uh, the White House has unveiled its budget request for 2024. Lots of information, on, you know, specific to U.S. DOT. The baton has been uh, passed over to Congress. Two questions. Ash Joe's uh, takeaways on the White House's budget request, and what is some either anticipation or expectations on how the budget process will take place in this divided Congress uh, this year? Uh, great question, Eugene. So, you know, one of the things that we're always fighting for in the transportation space, and certainly at the state DOT level, is making sure that we rely on the Highway Trust Fund. Right, because that's a multi-year authorization that is not subject to kind of the annual changes in appropriations priorities as it is for domestic discretionary spending programs. Uh, and so we're able to, you know, put a lot of the general fund monies uh, to make sure that we can see a substantial trust fund funding increase in the IIJA. And if you recall, Congress did something unusual with the IIJA as well in providing massive amounts of advanced appropriations. So, right, those are supplemental, 
excuse me, general fund dollars that are not subject to future appropriations. In essence, Congress decided that, look, we're going to commit these general fund dollars for the next five years, and we're not going to mess around with it. This isn't just like, you know, typical general fund authorization where, yes, you have the permission to theoretically spend some money on these kinds of things. But Congress really delivered on that. And we're so thankful for that because between the highway trust fund dollars and the advanced appropriations dollars, uh, the budget structure or the fund annual funding amount, you know, through 2026 really isn't expected to change from what we saw in the IIJA that gave that long-term blueprint, right? Again, capital programs take many years. The better that our members can know for the next five years how much they're getting, uh, the more helpful it is to more efficiently and effectively plan those federal dollars. And that's exactly what the budget shows this year. We expect the federal budget to show that next year and the year after that uh, as well. And that just really shows how important that, you know, kind of secure multi-year funding uh, really is. Now, that being said, uh, you know, there is the bigger conversation about the debt ceiling, uh, which really could throw <laughs> everything into the air. I mean, transportation is just one of so many pieces uh, that it could impact in an absolutely devastating manner. And I don't think anybody wants to really see that come to fruition. But within kind of the more of the highway and transportation space, I would say that we are running into some challenges in, are we able to really get those dollars uh, in the IJA in the most efficient and effective manner possible? By that, I mean, you know, there is this process which is very complicated. So I don't know how deep I can get into it but called August redistribution of the obligation limitation. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, so essentially, wow. yeah, I think the best analogy I can use is that, you know, the, the federal government says at the beginning of the fiscal year, look, you have $10 uh, committed uh, from the highway trust fund this year, but we're going to let you use only maybe $6 instead of the full $10 uh, and then we're going to, you know, save that remaining $4 for other stuff. If that other stuff doesn't get used, we'll give it to you, uh, the full $4, you know, but with only one month left in the federal fiscal year in August. Um, and so that's really been a challenge, I think, for our members in that they would love to have access to all of the IIJ dollars uh, in the formula program up front, right? rather than only being able to access a portion of it, uh, even with the appropriation bill in place, just to come back in August with 30 days left to program. Last year, it was a record amount of $6.2 billion uh, of highway funding in 30 days. I mean, it is not easy um, and it is something that is expected to be even higher uh, this year come August. Um, and so it, it is definitely an issue that we would like to find a better way to smooth out how the highway formula dollars are given out. And further compounding that challenge is this accounting discrepancy at the Federal Highway Administration, where they're seeing $3.5 billion more in their own uh, accounting system compared to what the USDOT has been keeping track of. Um, and so that's been a major, I think, unexpected challenge, right, uh, that the USDOT says goes back to 2005, 2006 time period. But it could further, you know, impact and reduce the amount of um, highway funding available to state DOTs if you were to go with uh, the USDOT balance uh, that they say is their system of record. Um, but still can't quite point out how did $3.5 billion kind of disappear or why is there that difference? So that's another thing that we're trying to figure out uh, in a way that is as least impactful uh, to our state duty members. Young, in the uh, remaining six or seven minutes that we've got left, I want to ask a question, and that is that uh, a number of states, Arizona, Michigan, Texas, and a couple of others, have been pretty aggressive with regards to autonomous vehicle research, and they've really open those states up for uh, laboratories. They've allowed the states to become laboratories for AVs and the like. Uh, but we don't have any sort of national policy on autonomous vehicles. It's been discussed in Congress, but it seems as though 
uh, we're still a ways away from getting to that point. Uh, what needs to be done or, or do we need to do anything with regards to that and sort of let the states figure it out and then the state that comes together with the best policy, maybe that's the one or a portion of it becomes the, the national framework for something. What are your thoughts? Uh, great question. Um, I think that's been one of the most challenging kind of nuts to crack really <laughs> in terms of policy at the federal level and how it interfaces with state and local level because you know we've had the AV Start Act Mm -hmm. in the House. We've had the Self-Drive Act in, in the Senate, and that was at this point, you know, five, six, seven years ago. Yeah, 2017. Um, exactly right. Um, and at the time, you know, and it still remains, the, the, the principal question is when the driver and the vehicle becomes a fused kind of entity, and when you have the federal government that traditionally regulates vehicles, and then you typically have the states and locals uh, regulate the you know, operator of the vehicle. Where do you draw that distinction? Do you say that because the vehicle is also the operator, the Fed should really take care of it? Or because the you know, vehicle is the operator uh, for the same reason? You could theoretically say that the state and locals should really take care of the entire framework there through their licensing right uh, regime. Um, and that's a, that's a really thorny question. Um, we still do believe that traffic laws uh, and again, the licensing standards and the like uh, needs to be at the state level. Um, and we have had obviously existing examples like how the driver's license system works uh, in an interoperable manner throughout the country. So there's a ways to figure that out. But I think, you know, we just haven't been able to, I think, among so, so many issues uh, that are out there with AVs in general, that's probably really the principal challenge for us at the state level uh, and also with our local partners. Eugene, you get the final question and then we'll ask uh, Mr. Lee where we can get some contact information for the good folks at Ashto. But uh, you get the final question of our guests this morning. The term supply chain really uh, entered the national discourse uh, for the freight industry and the trucking industry. Supply chain is ubiquitous, uh, but nevertheless, in the post-pandemic economy, uh, this administration really dedicated uh, vast resources to improving connectivity. Again, another two-part question, Jung, is uh, from Ash's point of view, how has the attention to supply chain connectivity, uh, you know, been measured so far? And what are aspects that still remain, you know, on a left on the to-do list? Uh, that's a really great question. I mean, I think, again, having more resources through the IIJA just expands the universe of things that you're able to do to improve the supply chain and the freight uh, network. And I mean, I think the thing about the freight program, too, is that sometimes uh, federal programs or the policies kind of get pigeonholed into like the urban areas, right, or the rural areas or the suburban areas. But freight really does impact every corner uh, of the country. And so our members, I think, are able to take advantage, again, as I mentioned earlier, in combination of some of the discretionary grant programs to really and finally, you know, get at the longstanding bottlenecks. Uh, but we're also looking at opportunities to improve truck parking, uh, obviously. Uh, we're also looking at, you know, electrifying uh, the network as much as possible because of the huge focus on EV infrastructure. And, you know, it's not just about obviously the passenger fleet as well, but really the truck uh, fleet as well. So, you know, I don't think this is something that, again, you, you snap a finger and say like, okay, we've really got this figured out. Uh, but I think just having the appreciation of how, you know, perhaps the just-in-time system certainly has its weaknesses, right, in terms of, you know, how, how much is the effic most efficient level of redundancies that we have to think about, uh, I think, more intentionally going forward. I mean, that's certainly on the minds uh, of our state DOT members for sure. Uh, Young, would you please give us a couple of seconds here and tell us <coughs> how our viewers and listeners can uh, find out more about Ashto online at the various social media platforms? Yeah, absolutely. So we're on all of them, <laughs> like 
you know, Twitter, Facebook, uh, you, you name them. But uh, the, I think the best resource for all the policy stuff that we do is uh, policy.transportation.org. Uh, you can find resources on IIJA implementation, our policy action agenda for 2023, all of our comment letters to, you know, our partners at the U federal government as well and other stakeholders. Uh, so definitely that's the go-to resource, policy.transportation.org. Fair enough. Thank you for joining us. It's been an interesting conversation and we've uh, enjoyed the conversation, sir. Same here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. We want to thank our guest from Ashto, Young Lee, for being so generous with his time to ask and answer our questions. This webcast will be available for viewing on demand. Go to ttnews.com for more information about how you can watch our interview with Ashto's Young Lee. I'm Dan Ronan. On behalf of my TT colleague, Eugene Malero, we thank you for watching this edition of Transport Topics Newsmakers. Thank you for joining us today. For more information on future episodes, visit ttnews.com. This has been Transport Topics Newsmakers.